My grandfather was a, a farmer. He was born in 1895, farmed through the Depression, farmed through the shift from horses to tractors. He didn't work in the fields on Sunday. And when you're a farmer and it's harvest time, to not be harvesting is an economic risk. But he made a choice out of his faith convictions not to harvest on Sundays. And I think about that a lot. What's the spirit of that that I'm called to live into? I don't know that I'm much of a joke teller, but you know, I mentioned I'm a Mennonite and, and there is this uh, why can't Mennonites tell jokes timing. It's really helpful to think about Sabbath as a different kind of time. And when we enter into it, as, as we block out certain things that we just say we're not going to do for this period of time, then it opens up time for us to experience life and experience relationships, to experience God's creation in different ways. And it, um, it puts some boundaries on the way we use time. And in the book, I talk about Sabbath and work. And I don't think work is a bad thing. In fact, I think work is a gift. And I see God working in the six days of creation. And, and we should participate in, in the, the patterns that God participates in. So I see work as a good thing. But it's not everything there is to our lives. And, and Sabbath marks out a different kind of time. And it says there's a time to work, a time to work really hard, but that isn't the fullness of who we're created to be. So this different kind of time is a way for us to, to celebrate who God is, to celebrate God's creation, and um, to experience, uh, I, it's a countercultural kind of thing because our culture doesn't understand time in that way. Um, and then here's where, for me, I, I get excited because Sabbath is not just about what we do for this one day a week because it spills out into the rest of our weeks. It, it, it flavors the whole of life. So as we practice living in Sabbath time, once a week for this, this one day, we, we get practice, we get trained in how to be more present with each other and how to notice the goodness around us. And so when you're sitting in a coffee shop with a friend on a Wednesday afternoon and your mind is wandering to the work you have to do or you know, that's piled up, those, I would say those who practice Sabbath, who have been practicing that, are a little bit better trained to bring themselves back to that moment. And how can I really be with my, my friend? How can I be with this person in this time? So, so then we find these Sabbath moments that, that pop up throughout the week, not just during this 24-hour period. Now, some people then, and, and authors that I respect, advocate for maybe not a 24-hour period each week, but these Sabbath moments. And I, don't, I see it a little bit differently than that. I, I really do want us to take a whole day. And I don't think uh, the, the author Marva Dawn talks about Sabbath as, as it's a gift. It's like a, a feast. You don't just nibble at a feast. Like consume this fully. And so I'm all for Sabbath moments through the week, but I, I don't know that those in themselves provide enough structure for us to experience its riches. So I'm, I really think it's a, it's a gift for us to, to carve out this time and enter into it differently. The rabbis use wedding imagery to dis, sometimes to describe this kind of time, and this, this uh, wedding celebration. It's, a little, it's different. It's a different feel than the day in, day out, mundane sort of, sort of living. That's, that's wonderful time as well, but there's a, a different thing going on. Most of the people I talk to, if, if they've thought about Sabbath at all, and, I, and I'm amazed at how many people have no idea about Sabbath. So I talk about this in, in classes I teach, and one class is a theme that runs through the whole semester. And over and over again, I have students, lots of students who say, I have never heard anybody teach on Sabbath. Like, I didn't even know that was a thing. And, and these are people who have grown up in the church. So, so they don't even know enough to have misconceptions. But I would say for those who have 
heard of Sabbath, experienced it. The, the biggest misconception is that, that it's mainly about a list of do's and don'ts. That it's, uh, you know, give me a checklist and I can tell if I'm doing it right or wrong. And, and I want to say at some point in the conversation, we need to talk about the structure and what we put in place, what we choose to do or not do. But way before we get that, let's talk about the spirit of this day. What, what is it we're, uh, what, what's the quality of this time? What is the invitation here that God has for us? What are some of the ways this, this forms us, that shapes us? So that it's more, um, it's so much more inviting and it's, it's celebratory. So I think a lot of Christians in the U.S. don't have that image of it. If they have any image of it, it's, it's kind of mediated through, you know, 19th century Sabbath images we get from like Tom Sawyer or Little House on the Prairie, you know, kind of Puritan theology mitigated, you know, mediated through them where Sabbath is this time where kids can't play and you got to wear uncomfortable clothing and, you, you, you know, you get to sit still and you just can't wait for it to get over so you can go back to having fun. And that's, uh, there's, there's some of that residue left. And um, so in, in the book, in what I do in my class, I have students engage in a Sabbath experiment. And this is part of, uh, part of the book. I invite people to a Sabbath experiment. And I say, for this experiment, here's some guidelines. They are not the right way to do Sabbath. There are, uh, if, if you choose to go forward with you know, adding some elements. You might choose some of these. You might let others go. That's fine. But for this experiment, I say, let's try it this way. The very first item in the experiment is to choose one thing you're going to do to celebrate. Because we've, I, because I think so many people get focused on the, the do's and the don'ts. And, uh, and I, I want people to come into this thinking, what's, what's a fun thing to do? On, on this day set apart. And uh, a lot of people find, you know, inviting friends over for dinner, doing a family outing, playing board games with kids, those kinds of things that, that actually uh, are possible when that time is opened up. When, when you've ruled out things like, say, we're not going to do screen time as a family for this day. And then you're kind of sitting around bored, like, well, what, what do we do then? And, and I think boredom can be this really good thing. It can be this really generative sort of time. And uh, um, I, I hear over and over again uh, families who, who have done this say, well, so we, decide, so we pulled out these board games we haven't played in ages. And, and it was, they find these times of connecting, these times of laughter, these times of, of uh, this quality, this kind of quality time and quantity time with, with ones they love. In the Jewish tradition, Sabbath is sometimes, uh, that experience is, is compared to a wedding. They talk about the Sabbath bride. The, the day is personified as the Sabbath bride. And you think of a wedding, and that's, how, if one person shows up to a wedding, that's not much of a celebration, right? It, it's when everybody shows up, friends and the family, then there's this celebration that, that takes place. And I think Sabbath is, is like that. Um, now, I want to hold together... Uh, a, a personal individual element and a communal element. I think there's room for both. So some of the rest, maybe it involves going off on your own for, for some time. But, uh, but where's the communal celebration as well? It makes me think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's admonition about, you know, let the one who can't be in community beware of being alone and let the one who can't be alone beware of being in community. Like there's a danger going too much with your own wiring, uh, and and the balance isn't going to look the same for everybody. Um, but so I think of how personalities work out with this. If somebody's more introverted, they're going to gravitate more towards the long times of silence on the Sabbath and the the, the individual walks, and and that's great. But but and if somebody's wired more. In, in the extrovert direction, they're going to be more like, hey, let's get some people together and throw the football in the park or let's, you know, let's have a big dinner Saturday night to kick this thing off. Well, I think those two people need each other. I think the, that high energy person who's always with people and you know, brings energy to, to the party now and then needs to have some, some alone time. 
the person who lives alone, <laughs> yeah, who spends a lot of time alone, um, probably needs some help in, in the celebration end of things, some, some connections with other people. So, um, uh, so I see both of those held together. Now, culturally, there's some interesting things going on in terms of um, downtime or uh, it's kind of a secular Sabbath, like treat yourself to a spa day, that kind of thing. And, and it is very much focused on the individual. And so there's, there's something good here, I think, in that uh, there's some cultural recognition of a need to slow down. But there's, there's this real difference as well. For one, it doesn't include this communal, communal dimension. But the other thing going on is the object of, sa- of, of that, of what we might call a secular Sabbath, that's a, a term uh, Lauren Winner uses, and is the object of that is me. Whereas the object of the Christian Sabbath is, is God. This is ultimately focused on God, and, and we participate in it. It's kind of like God is the direct object, and we're the indirect object in the sentence. But we're in the sentence, too. But uh, the, the, the secular Sabbath, the treat yourself to a spa day because you deserve it, that's doing something different. Now, there might be ways we can tap that and say, they've got it partly right. Um, uh, the, the Christian Sabbath, as I understand it, um, is about our own rejuvenation, and, and it is life-giving. But I want parts where we connect with others, with community, because it seems so, well, all through Scripture, it's, it's a communal activity. I use technology, and, and I would refer specifically to intellectual technology, which is kind of what Nicholas Carr uses to describe this. It, it's different. I mean, we all like a faucet's technology, but that's not the kind of technology I'm talking about. But intellectual technology that has to do with the internet, social media, those sorts of ways of communicating are pervasive in our culture. They're, they're everywhere. I use them. I wrote my book on a laptop, right? So I'm not anti-technology. I would want us, though, to ask, how does our use of technology form us? Um, you know, when, when I first started using, when I first got on the internet in early 90s, it was basically lists of things that you could look up. There was no, there weren't any graphics. There, it, you know, I had to have an address to know where to go. There weren't, the search engines were rudimentary. And at that point, it never occurred to me to stop and ask, oh, how is this technology forming me morally, forming my community? And, uh, but now, you know, decades later, I think if we don't stop and ask that question, um, I think something's wrong. We, we should ask those questions about every aspect of our life. How is this f- cultural artifact or the, these cultural trends forming us? And um, so I want to ask that question about technology. I'm not saying you should, you know, cancel your Facebook account or, or stop tweeting. But how does it form us? And it's, there's some really interesting research coming out of the field of neuroscience related to this and um, specifically with neuroplasticity that says, you know, when I was growing up, the idea was by the time you may be a teenager, your brain is set and that's, that's what you got for the rest of your life. But neuroscience is now saying actually our brains continue to change and they, parts of them can grow. We can actually grow new synapses later in life. Now that's significant when it comes to technology because the research shows the ways we engage in technology uh, changes the wiring in our brain. And so the parts of our brain that are used to make quick decisions, to scan scads of information, um, to, to sort through priorities really quickly, those parts of our brains get rewired and they grow. And, and that can be a, a benefit, that can be a good thing. But the research also shows that the parts of our brains that are used for deeper thinking and uh, for um, wrestling through more complicated issues actually atrophy if all we're doing is using that quick link kind of thinking that's common related to social media and, and internet usage. So, but think about it. So if that part of your brain is actually physiologically shrinking, what's, what are the implications of that for prayer? What are the implications of that for thinking about 
the refugee crisis that are going on, that's going on. Physiologically, not just like, do I want to think that or not, but actually in my body, I'm not, I'm not as equipped to have those kinds of engagements. And so I see Sabbath as connected to this because Sabbath carves out this place in time that gives us practice that, that in which we, we exercise different parts of our brain. We, we exercise the parts of our brains that move us into contemplation, the parts of our brains that uh, we, w- when we allow our minds to wander and dream and ponder and slow down. And so those parts of our brains get strengthened. And then we're able in other times of the week to, to use those parts of our brains as well. So, so there's this connection between technology, neuroplasticity, and, and Sabbath, I think. And I want us to pause and think about that. I want us to not just think about it. I want us to pause and do something with that um, because it, it matters for the ways we shape our, our communities of faith. It matters for the ways that that we sh- uh, pursue our, our own walk. Uh, but I, I hope you're picking up, I'm always referring this also to our communities of faith because I don't see Sabbath as just an individual practice. Um, there, is, there are individual choices we make related to it, but it's, it's a communal practice. It has always been the way it was given to us in scripture. It's a communal practice. And especially in a culture like ours that doesn't, um, where, where the culture as a whole doesn't observe a Sabbath. Uh, there was a time culturally in the U.S. when that happened. But if we're going to do this in a culture like we have today, that we're, we're culturally actually more and more is getting plugged into Sundays. If we want to do this, it's, gonna, it's pretty important for us to figure out a communal way to do this. How are we encouraging you know, in our local churches, our local bodies? How are we building each other up? How are we helping to reduce the expectations on each other uh, on this day and not clogging it full of, uh, of more meetings, of more service projects and that kind of thing. Eugene Peterson, actually, he's another one who uh, writes on Sabbath who's influenced me. And he says, what, what we need to do is just stop. Just st- stop doing committee stuff. Stop asking people to do all the things we ask them to do. And so they can, they can actually live more fully into the kind of life that God calls us to. So I love my tradition, and, and it does have something of a, of a, a thread of, of critiquing culture, standing against culture. But, um, but no, I'm not against culture. In fact, we can't live outside of culture. Even those who are sort of anti the dominant culture have their own culture. And so I'm not just on, you know, writing this anti-culture rave. You know, I mean, I, I mean I'm not just raging against the culture. Um, I actually think we should engage the culture, and I think Sabbath helps us to do that. But I want us to, to, um, to do that in reflective kinds of ways. And, but here's the other thing about culture. As I said, we all live in a culture. And, and as Christians, I want us to be proactive in the sorts of, of culture we're creating. The sort, which I think is, we're called, I think, to create an alternative social structure, to, to live into the kingdom of God, which is different from any culture we find on earth. There can be overlap, but, but there's, it's not identical. And so, um, so no, I'm not anti-culture, but, but I think my Mennonite tradition helps me to not simply accept the culture that's given to us. It helps me to you know, my people are calling me to be somewhat uncomfortable just living in the culture I'm living in. But I, but I also want to say there, there are places of beauty in, our, in the dominant culture today. It's not that the dominant culture is all bad. There are, there are good things going on. There are people being cared for. There are ways that we're working to better protect the environment and those kinds of things. So I think there are ways we can celebrate what's going on. But, but we've got to be discerning. And um, uh, to me, that's, that's a piece that my tradition helps me and challenges me to, to do. One of the things that I've 
thought a lot about and, and grown in, in my understanding over the, over the years is how Sabbath um, connects to issues of, of social ethics. And um, here, one of the, I'm, I'm quite influenced by John Howard Yoder, again, from, from my tradition, but, but I think he's been pretty significant in Christian ethics across the board. And Yoder talks about how he's got a couple books, Christian Witness to the State and Body Politics. And in, in these books, he, one of the things he's doing is showing how what we do within the body of Christ, the practices in which we engage, have social extensions. They, they affect the way we engage in the world and the things we try to work for in the world. So they're not just for us. So the Lord's Supper isn't just an internal practice. It calls us to work for, for uh, a leveling in the broader culture. Um, things like how we make decisions and, and baptism. Those, those all have social extensions. And I think uh, so Sabbath does as well. So, for example, when we look at how Sabbath came about, when we look at uh, um, the Ten Commandments, we look at Sabbath as, as this fourth commandment and this call to step out of work. But it's interesting how it connects with the first commandment. And here I've, I've found Walter Brueggemann really helpful in how he uh, talks about this. So the, the Israelites were slaves, Right? They're slaves in Egypt, and they're functioning under this oppressive regime, which is focused on wealth accumulation at the expense of those at the bottom of the pyramid. And, uh, and, and it's focused on efficiency. It's, it's, a, it's an economy focused on more production, higher efficiency. Who cares what happens to the people at the bottom? So we have the story of the Israelites then, you know, uh, Pharaoh s- takes away, they're, they're no longer provided as many raw resources, but they've got to now gather their own straw, but they've got to produce the same amount. And we get this exodus event. God leads them out of that kind of slavery, out of that kind of oppressive system, out of a system underwritten by the Egyptian gods. And the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me, right? That's not just like a, a general statement. That's specifically referring to those Egyptian gods, right? I'm the Lord your God who led you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. So I'm not like those gods that underwrote this system of relentless production. And, and then that first commandment is embodied then in this fourth commandment. One day a week, you don't work. Because remember, I'm, you're no longer slaves. So I see that as really significant for us today because we're, a lot of us are living in slavery. We're slaves to a different regime, right? This ceaseless production, though, is the same kind of thing. And um, Sabbath is a challenge to that. Sabbath connects with this claim, I am the Lord your God who led you out of, out of Egypt. So it calls us... I would so thinking of social extension. We don't. It's not just a day we do ourselves, but a social extension of this has to do with how do we live in a technological system where efficiency becomes a god, right? Now I'm all for efficiency in a lot of ways. Like if I'm standing in the in the line at, a, at the grocery store, I want that clerk to be efficient. Like <laughs> you know, get that person in front of me through. And but but all too often in our culture, efficiency becomes. Uh, a ruthless God. And so in the, in the name of efficiency, people suffer. People, you know, uh, have to generate uh, more and more w- with n- no extra resources. We've got corporate policies that make more money for the corporation, but they don't account for uh, how people are really doing. They don't take into account people's well-being. So if we are a Sabbath people, we're called to challenge those sorts of ways. We're, we're called to look at how is something like efficiency playing out in our work laws, in corporate policy, in, in our societal structures, and how do we advocate for people affected by that? How do we advocate for people to have a living wage? How do we advocate for um, people who, who are being treated unjustly, whether it's by the legal system, by business systems, that kind of thing. So that's an example of where I, I see Sabbath having, it, it has a social extension. It's, it's not just in-house. Um, another one, you know, Sabbath 
calls us to have this day off. Well, I know there are people who are working two or three jobs seven days a week. I'm not going to go up to that woman, that single mom, and say, hey, and by the way, take a day off. Like, I think that's cruel. <laughs> and, and Paul writes about, you know, don't use Sabbath. He says, don't let anybody judge you by your, you know, your, your, the new moon, the festivals, Sabbath, that kind of thing. So Sabbath should never be this litmus test of if you're really spiritual or not. But here's what Sabbath means to me in that context. It, the social extension is what are we doing to create a culture where that person can have a day off? That person is earning enough money on six days of the week that that person can take one day off. Because if we're living in a system where a person can work full time and not have enough to provide, um, that's not a system that match, matches up with God's economy. And um, so I think Sabbath calls us, if we, if we unpack its theology, it calls us to that kind of living. Yes, a, a couple, Samuel Dresner, and um, again, another Jewish rabbi who, who was quite influenced by Heschel. And Dresner, I, I really like his little book on, on Sabbath. Um, there's another one, Norm Wiersba has a book on Sabbath that I think does a really good job uh, connecting Sabbath to creation care and, and some of those dimensions. And um, then there are, there, you know, there are a lot of, there are more and more books coming out. I mean, I think this is kind of recognized as, as a, a valuable gift. Some of them are more kind of devotional in nature. And, and certainly I hope my book is encouraging, but that's, I didn't set out to write a devotional kind of, <laughs> kind of piece. Um, and, um, and some of them are, are written more for the vision of Sabbath that, that I see in some books put forward is of, you know, carve out this really peaceful time for your mellow walk in a park and, and observe the trees. And, and, you know, I love nature. I, I am out in nature multiple times each week. But I think there are other ways to experience Sabbath than just that. Because a lot of people aren't wired that way or live in contexts where that's harder. So what's it look like to live Sabbath in an urban context, you know, with with traffic going by and light, you know, neon lights and, and that kind of peaceful walk in the park isn't just around the corner. And so I want, I want to talk about that. Some, so w when I think of other books, there are books that have really influenced me significantly related to this, but I'm trying to do, there's, there's a niche here that I think isn't, isn't tapped into that has to do with how we live this in t today if, if you're not living you know, off the grid somewhere, which, I mean, I'm drawn to that. I'm not against that. <laughs> but, but most people aren't, aren't going there. They're not moving off the grid. And, and so in the reality of living in an urban context, living in the suburbs, uh, living in a technological age, what do we do? As a practical the theologian, I live with one foot in the academy and one foot firmly grounded in, in the local church. And um, it's an interesting fence to straddle, if you will. Um, I had in mind, uh, well, my students, seminary students, people who are going to be leading congregations, um, I had in mind... Uh, thoughtful Christians in the church. And I know like with any book, like the danger is trying to hit too broad an audience, right? Well, I want everybody to read it. Um, I think mine, the people I had in mind were um, active participants in local congregations. And I hope that our seminary professors are active participants in their congregations and, and seminarians. I wrote it in a style that I think is pretty accessible so you don't have to have an advanced degree to understand it. But I hope that my colleagues in the academy and my students as they read it would, uh, would agree that there's theological substance there. I didn't try to write, uh, well, one reader said, there's not a lot of fluff here. I, it's, a, it's narrative. I, I use some stories. I use some personal examples. But, uh, but I'm really trying to push theologically. I'm trying to push in terms of ethics, Christian ethics. And so I think in our seminaries, 
um, there's been this move to, to emphasize, again, spiritual formation, which historic, at some point historically sort of dropped from view, and it was more about you know, delivering content. And there's, there's a renewal in that. So I would hope that um, professors in, in ministry courses, um, in Christian ethics courses that want to connect social ethics with personal formation, I, want, I hope those people... I want those people to read it, but I also want thoughtful Christians in congregations uh, who, uh, who are open to being prodded a little bit. I think there's a little bit of an edge to the book. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to be, I'm not trying to beat people over the head, but I am trying to make people uncomfortable. I think that, that is required for change. So I'm looking at thoughtful, reflective Christians in local churches. I'm looking at people involved in theological education, both students and, and professors who, who are interested in, in doing this kind of thing.